Hi, and welcome back to this class. In the previous lesson, we sketched the processor structure. We learned that a processor, regardless of its type, executes a program as a sequence of instructions that translate into useful computation for the software application. At that point, we took a super simple C instruction line A equal to A plus B plus C and we translated it into the corresponding sequence of assembly instructions. Wow! At that point, we realized that a single line of C code can be translated, because of the underlying architecture, into six assembly instructions. Now, given that sequence of assembly instructions, we are now interested in understanding how the processor is going to process them. Within this slide, we can appreciate a possible starting scenario. By the way, do not forget that this is a kind of abstraction simplification of a real execution. Going back to our example, the program counter, also abbreviated in PC, is storing the value of the next instruction that has to be executed, and we are also assuming that all the data and instructions are stored in the memory. Which is quite a strong assumption, but for objectives of this example, we can accept it. First of all, we do have to read instruction 0789 that was the one value stored in the program counter. As we can appreciate, reading instruction 0789 is an operation involving several tasks. Because of the value 0789, we are accessing the memory at the corresponding address. The control unit is sending a read command on the control bus to load the necessary information from the memory to the local register. Because of this, now the instruction is loaded into the instruction register and the value stored in the program counter is updated with the value of the next instruction to be executed. Which means that it is now storing 0790. At this point, we can access the necessary information to know which instruction has to be executed. Instruction 0789 was a load, which means that we have to access the memory to read a specific value that has to be stored in the local register. In this specific case, the value we are looking for is stored at 4000 location, and because of the control unit sending again a read command, we can load the value stored in the location of 4000 into the local register R02. Once this is done, we are now ready to proceed with the next instruction, which is the one stored in the program counter. To know what we'll have to do to execute the new instruction, we do have to perform the same operation we went through for instruction 0789. We are accessing the memory at the other store in the program counter, which is 0790. The control unit is sending a read command on the control bus to load the necessary information from the memory to the local register. And because of this, we are now having the new instruction stored in the instruction register. Meanwhile, we do have to remember to update the value stored in the program counter to point to the new instruction to be executed next. Instruction 0790 is a read, which means that we are now experiencing the same set of operations on different address and the values with respect to the previous one. Instruction 0790 is again a load, which means that also in this case we have to access the memory to read the data that has to be stored in the local register. In this case, the value we are looking for is stored at the 4004 address, and thanks to the control unit sending the read command, we can load the data stored in the memory into the local register R03. Once the execution is completed, we are now ready to start the execution of the next instruction, which is now stored at the 0791 address. This means that, as for the previous two instructions, we are accessing the memory at the address stored in the program counter, which is 0791. The control unit is sending a read command on the control bus to load the necessary information from the memory to the local register. And now, we have the new instruction stored in the instruction register. Meanwhile, once more, the value stored in the program counter has to be updated to point to the new instruction to be executed. What it is now interesting with this new instruction is that it is no longer a load instruction, but an add. This means that the control unit is passing the necessary information to the arithmetic logic unit, or LAU, to perform the required operation which means that it is configuring the LAU to perform an add and it is passing the necessary value stored in the corresponding register. Once the computation has been completed, the result is stored back on an LAU register, 
The common counter is updated with the address of the next instruction that has to be executed, and the next signal is sent to the program status word register, which is basically a register which keeps track of the current state of the system. Now, wasn't it boring? Yes, I know, it was. But that was the objective of this lesson. No, 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 don't get me wrong, not to be boring, but to let you experience something. This example, even if it's quite simple, remember that we started with a single C instruction, even without having to complete the execution of its corresponding assembly code, shows that even a simple operation, such as an addition of three values, results in multiple assembly instructions that are taking a lot of time to be executed. On the contrary, the FPGA is an inherently parallel processing fabric capable of implementing any logic and arithmetic function that can run on a processor. The main difference is that the Vivado High Level Synthesis HLS compiler, which is used by SDXL to transform OpenCL software description into RTL, is not inherited by the restriction of a cache and a unified memory space. The computation of A is compiled by HLS into several LUTs required to achieve the size of the output operand. As an example, we can assume that in the original software program, the variables A, B, and C are defined with a short data type, since they may not require 32 bit values. Within this context, this type, which defines a 16 bit data container, gets implemented as a 16 LUTs by Vivado HLS, while on the processor, no matter what, each variable was still using, if executed on a 32-bit machine, 32-bit width variables. The LUT used for the computation are exclusive to this operation only. Unlike a processor, where all computations share the same LAU, an FPGA implementation instantiates an independent set of LUTs for each computation in the software algorithm. In addition to assigning unique LUT resources per computation, the FPGA differs from a processor in both memory architecture and the cost of memory accesses. In an FPGA implementation, the HLS compiler arranges memories into multiple storage banks as close as possible to the point of use in the operation. This results in an instantaneous memory bandwidth which far exceeds the capabilities of a processor. Moreover, with respect to computational throughput and memory bandwidth, the HLS compiler exercises the capabilities of the FPGA fabric through the processes of scheduling, pipelining, and data flow. Although transparent to the user, these processes are integral stages of the software compilation process that extract the best possible circuit level implementation of the software application. In the following, we are going to have a better understanding on how the processes of scheduling, pipelining, and data flow are working.